Uh, so this is, this is meant to, to give you a chance to ask questions. There were two wonderful presentations uh, uh, by Faith and Caroline, and I think uh, it, it, it's, a, it's sort of a fitting way to pull together many of the things. Uh, uh, so I know you missed it, Caroline, but in the morning we had a blockchain that was going to track every coffee bean. Aaron yes. is out there in the audience. <laughs> So, we are uh, doing that. So any <laughs> questions? Yes, go ahead. Hello, uh, I'm Maria from Michigan State. Um, I think that you both touched on you know, more of a positive side of ethics, making sure you're developing suppliers and they have resources for continuous improvement as well. I'm curious to know how you mitigate any risks between working with international suppliers who are underdeveloped, whether that be in their reporting systems, in their communication systems, and how you mitigate that risk throughout your company when it comes to overall communication and productivity. Okay, so I'll start with that. Um, so we, we, how do I say, we leverage the, um, the plants and the resources in, the plant, in those countries that we have plants. So for example, in India, we source a lot, we source a lot in China, and we have plants and we have infrastructures in both. So we, have, so we count on this, so if I have a plant in Three Rivers, Michigan, who has an issue with a supplier in India, we send the India team over there. So we leverage across um, functional areas and our business units to do that, so. And at Starbucks, um, we have the third party verification program, and all of our suppliers that work with us have to go through an ethical sourcing assessment uh, depends on the risk criteria. Sometimes it's a self-assessment. Other times we actually do send people to the factories to do physical um, inspection. And oftentimes we do find double sets of books or we find unsafe working conditions, in which case the supplier gets assigned a zero tolerance rating and we're not able to procure the products from them until they mitigate all those issues. So once again, even though we say we're not gonna source from you now, if you do wanna do business with us in the future, you really have to fix whatever the list of issues is. Um, more, most, more often than not, they actually do fix those issues because ultimately they do wanna supply to Starbucks. So that allows us then to actually see you know, a bad situation get better because we're very strict and we're like, we're not, we're not gonna work with you right now. So Carolyn, one question I have is that you know, there's cafe, which Starbucks supports, but then there's fair trade, there's Correct. songbird friendly yes. coffee and all of those things. So what is the industry doing? Is this, is this, you know, is our retailers coming together with a common standard or do you see each retail chain or brand creating its own? Um, I think, you know, Starbucks partnered with Conservation International because at okay. that point in time we felt that there the standards that were out there were not up to our standard. Okay. Um, and that's why we created our own cafe practices program. We're happy for anybody to join it. <laughs> uh, and also, I'm not saying that fair trade is not good. It's a very solid program, but it wasn't what Starbucks wanted to do. Okay. Um, we are trying to build similar programs with cocoa hmm. and with tea. Hmm. I think tea is one of those areas that is actually uh, has a lot of room for improvement, and we're hoping that others will come and, and join us on the quest to really make that also very highly ethically sourced commodity. Um, so everybody's welcome to join. Uh, we're not having our own programs in a silo. We would love for everybody, all of our competitors to come on board. But as long as they have a program of their own and they're trying to do good, you know, they're helping. So nobody's better. It's just we, we do have an obligation, though, as retailers, um, people buying the, the product to really do with it the best that we can and help support the people that are actually growing and the environment where it's coming from. So I think, you know, just, just as a point of contact, I think this was eight <laughs> years ago, we actually had, we had partnered with Starbucks to have a case competition on exactly this yeah. notion of sourcing. At that time, we were focusing on organic milk at that time. But I, I know at that point that there was this issue that fair trade had a bias towards small farms, mm -hmm. whereas cafe is open to any size yeah. farms. Correct. That, that was, that is yeah. one of the differences. Okay. Any other questions? Hi, I read an article a few years ago, and it really changed my perspective on organic produce and products, and it was about the effects of a local community, and it was tea growing. Um, and it actually, um, the organic agencies that did the organic crop certification wouldn't let them spray in the area for mosquitoes. And um, this article was talking about the effects <coughs> of what it was doing to malaria and the mm -hmm. local population. 
and it, it effect, affected me enough that I, I will not go into the store and, and, and grab organic products because it really kind of scares me uh, what we're, you know, admittedly removing chemicals from your, your, your produce and everything is good, but I, I really worry about what I'm doing to the indigenous populations in terms of um, what they are, are and are not allowed to do. Um, do you, have you seen that problem improve? Because it's been four or five years. I mean, are, are we still thrusting these consequences upon indigenous populations because of you know, preferences we have here? Yeah. Um, I'm not an expert on this, uh, but from my personal uh, understanding, um, I think we have an obligation to do what is right for the environment. And yes, sometimes the stigma of something is organic or so-and-so certified does potentially have consequences elsewhere. So it's important for us to not put labels on things, but truly understand the impact. And I think at Starbucks, we try our best to do that. Um, we don't have that much things labeled organic necessarily. We do have a few products, um, but it really depends on what is best for that industry, that community, and, and the product that we, that we provide to our customers and for the customer as well. But yeah, you're right, I think you make a good point. Having a label of something that sounds good not, does not necessarily always mean it is so. Uh, hi, I'm Suraj from Michigan State. And uh, my question is related to supply chain visibility. So when it comes to visibility, we need data. And in a manufacturing setup, we get that data from uh, ERP systems. So while working in a manufacturing setup, one of the challenges I realized is because you have so many ERP setups and you centrally manage, see the data. So there are constant changes in the logic and also you keep on adding some new things. So being on the top of the management when you make decisions, how do you trust that data? And if you have faced such issues, how you uh, tackle those? OK, so I think that one's for me. <laughs> um, so we, we implemented, you're right, so we have, um, we had the seven, 17 plans, they're very, very standardized, and now we have 75 plans, and they're very, not very standardized. So what we implemented was the very, very supply, supply chain basics, okay? So every plant has to follow these specific supply chain basics, even though we're on, um, I think we had 31 different, we went from one ERP system to 31 different systems. If you count, like J.D. Edwards, we had four different versions. So um, everybody has to do their transactions within 24 hours is one of our basics. So we have, um, we have these basics that require them, like receipts have to be within 24 hours, any production reports have to be in you know, production processing. So we have a lot of automation. And the ones we don't have automation, we have, um, they have, they're required to have them hand entered within 24 hours. So we, we tried to do it that way, so with the, we would get that information and then we upload to a, in this case, that's Hyperion. So we have a standard, even though we have different systems, we can we pull that information up that we can get at it in a couple different places. BI is one of them, which is where all the data sits and all the financials sit in Hyperion. So we have access to it that way. But it's been very difficult for sure as compared to how easy it was before. We are transferring everybody to Oracle is what we use. So we're transferring everybody to Oracle, but it's a two-it's a two-year project. So the end of 2021, we should be Oracle and Plex for all of our metal forming facilities. Did I catch, did I did I answer your question? Okay. Go ahead. You have the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hi, I'm Nilesh from uh, Grand School of Management, MBA. I, you talked about uh, some issue in India about the ethics. So uh, being a global company for both of you, how do you manage? Because uh, we are learning in class that uh, rules are different in every part of the world. So somewhere it might be legal, other part of the world might not be. How do you handle such issues? Um, take this one first. <laughs> Uh, so yes, obviously Starbucks is in 78 countries. Uh, if you can just imagine that, that's, that's a lot of different government regulations, different mm -hmm. languages, different set of rules. Um, and it's, it's very hard to keep up on it, but typically we work with really good um, uh, folks on the ground that, that are experts in that specific country. Um, and they definitely ensure that we follow the right regulations, that we follow the right policies and ultimately do the right thing. Uh, but it is challenging, because as you know, the, the world today, governments change. They mm -hmm. suddenly can create a new law mm -hmm. the day of, and you're trying to scramble, it's like, well, it wasn't here yesterday, but it is today, so what do you do? 
you have to just do the very best. Um, it is really important, though, that you have really good connections and, and have um, partners, we call Starbucks employees partners, um, really on the ground that, that are your go-to, that uh, you trust and, and they have an ear to the ground and know when things change, that we can adapt and, and amend whatever we're doing to make sure we're, we're sticking with, um, obviously, meeting our mission and values, but also meeting the regulations of the country. It's not easy. <laughs> And I, I have to echo that. So we, as I said earlier, we, we count on our, our, our plants that are on the ground there to keep us informed. And then we engage where we need to engage. And we, um, we hire, like I say, KPMG or PwC or whoever the, whoever the expert is in that area. We engage them as well so we can make sure that we're doing the right things right. So one question I have for both of you is, you know, as you think about companies that take actions which would potentially increase their own costs, okay, the question is, why are you doing it? Are you doing it because you need to do it to preserve this customer base? Are you doing it because the owners of the company decide that's our brand? Is, in other words, is it really self-interest, which is really look to have these customers and to survive in this industry, we need to do this? Or is, this, is there some sort of higher purpose saying, oh, well, even if you're going to make a lower margin, we're going to do this anyway? I think for... Starbucks is doing the right thing, and doing the right thing for us is our customers. We have customers, like I mentioned, 100 million customers a week go through our doors. Um, a lot of customers look to Starbucks as that third place, the place you go, you know, that's not home and that's not work, but you need a place to go. Um, so we do the right things for, to meet the needs of the customers that we have. Um, and obviously, we won't do anything unethical. Mm -hmm. um, so we won't be in a country that, for example, is known to not adhere to ethical standards. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, we also feel that if we could be that beacon of goodness in a place like that, then at least the customers will have a place to go where they feel is safe. Um, but yeah, we, we're in plenty of countries that where we have to pay a premium or we have to do local sourcing because we can't import stuff in because of the regulations. And we would rather do that and allow the customers to have the experience that they need instead of saying, well, I can't go there because it's too expensive. And that's it from our perspective is we, we protect the, our shareholders, hmm. number one. So we don't, we don't, we, we, we will exit a, a customer hmm. if we need to ex exit a customer. I mean, we, 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 we have done that actually. And we did it um, after we acquired Metal Dime Performance Group with all the customers and all the expectations and that kind of thing. If it was not um, good for our business or the right business, we didn't just walk out, but we worked with them. So we had a, we had a strategy, then our, our sales team went in, explained why we needed to pull out, how long, how long we thought we could keep up with it while they found another one. So we, I mean, we, we protected the interest of the shareholders in that same lane, but we don't, we don't accept all customers. Hi, everyone. So I'm Casper. Nice to meet you all. And I just want to ask a question. Uh, what is your biggest challenge either in your position and your companies, like for both two companies? Ask the question one more time. What was our biggest challenge? Biggest, biggest challenge. challenge. Like in your positions and in your companies, both. <laughs> Thank you. I'll say mine, mine changes almost every day. <laughs> so what I mean by that is right now, it's the tariffs. It's the tariffs and trying to, trying to understand how, how, it, how it impacts us, um, where, 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 can we get, where, where can we get relief and how fast, and then where, where do we have to spend more time and more energy. We go up, like you mentioned earlier, but we also go down. So we talk to our suppliers. If we have an issue, and it's a tariff issue that, that's going to cost us now 25%, and last, you know, last three months ago it was zero, we're in there with the, cust the supplier too because maybe there's something they can do to help us um, maybe where they're procuring their raw goods are from. So we work both with our customer, our suppliers and our customers. But right now, um, tariffs and mitigating those costs for 2019 is number one for me. But it does change. Yeah, I think um, tariffs, mm -hmm. uh, driver costs, labor costs, commodity costs going up is, is a challenge. But specifically in Starbucks in Seattle, uh, our, one of our biggest challenges is actually finding really good supply chain professionals. The reason is there's such a um, high demand for supply chain in Seattle because of Amazon. 
uh, that it's actually really, really hard to, um, to retain talent because Amazon is known for throwing buckets of money at somebody. Um, and it's really, really challenging finding really strong supply chain folks uh, to not take the nice little package over at the next guy next door. <laughs> uh, usually they come back after they vest, so it's okay, <laughs> but um, it's, it's actually very challenging. So for those of you that may be in areas where Amazon is moving into, watch out. And if you're from <laughs> Amazon, I'm still a fan and customer. <laughs> So, so, so when is Amazon going to deliver Starbucks coffee? Mm. Well, so, we... So, you know, it would be great to <laughs> press a button and have Amazon yeah, coffee Yeah, exactly. Here. Well, we are actually working on rolling out uh, delivery with Uber Eats. Mm. Um, we've rolled it out in Miami, and we're rolling it out in New York and Chicago and Seattle. Um, so, we're trying to figure out how to do it the most efficiently way. And Obviously, the challenge is not all beverages are really conducive to delivery. If you have whipped cream in it, it probably melts. Um, but we are actually doing that by trying to meet the customer where they're at. And sometimes they're at their desk, and they don't want to leave their house. So um, trying to meet that need state. So, so I've been told, I, I found out from our kids, that insomnia cookies can figure out where you're sitting in the library and come deliver the cookies to wow. you. Because mm -hmm. one of my daughters shipped cookies to our other daughter who was in the library, and they took a video of them delivering the insomnia cookie to where she was sitting in the library at midnight. So I might, I might need to talk to them. Yeah, yeah. So exactly. So send the coffee along. Any other questions? Yes. yes. Hi. Um, thank you both for being here. Uh, my name is Lola, and I'm from Georgetown University. Uh, one thing that we focus on is kind of cultivating the uh, entire person. And when it comes to risk management, it's almost less a question of when, like it's gonna happen, we know that it's inevitable. So my question is really around what sort of leadership skills do you feel like you've had to develop in order to address um, risk and challenges when they do occur um, at your companies? Well, supply chain risk at American Axle is one of, we, we have enterprise risk, we, we have risks all through our, um, through supply chain of course, but um, American Axle has enterprise risks and, and supply chain is one of the top risks of the company. So I spend a lot of time um, in with the risk policy company. I'm actually on the risk, pol risk policy. Um, so it's, it's really important um, all the way through our supply chain that we, we mitigate the risks. We have backup plans, backup modes is what, remember I mentioned earlier, supply chain basics. One of our supply chain basics is backup modes to make sure that no matter what process we have inside our plants and all the way through in supply chain that if something doesn't work, that we have another way to get it done. So if it's a, it's a system, issue, system um, process, that we have a manual process backup, that kind of thing, or an advanced supply chain, um, excuse me, advanced ASN provider, that we have a backup provider. So it's, it's I would say, um, Think about that as, as when you said yourself personally, when you get somewhere and it is your first job or your second job or as you, as you work through that, um, make sure that you're thinking about that personally, that if something, if something you're doing is important, then if, and if, if those tools are taken away from you, how are you gonna do it? And then build that in yourself. You'll, you'll, be, you'll be a step ahead of everybody else. And um, from a Starbucks perspective, we really take more of a, a personal approach um, systems and processes are great, but it's typically the people that do them that either do it well or not well. Um, so we try to build really strong relationships, specific with our suppliers, which helps us mitigate risk. Um, if a supplier knows they have a win-win relationship with Starbucks, typically if something goes wrong, they're, they're able to really adapt to the need that we have in that point in time. Uh, same thing with partners at Starbucks. Not every, no, nobody's perfect, everybody has their down days. Um, and you know your question about data, data isn't very clear all the time. You really need, once again, a human to analyze this data and make sense of it. Um, and so it's really important to focus on the people and provide them the skills and the tools and the processes to really make their job easier so that when a crisis does arise or there's a risk that they might, they know how to react to it. And they don't panic, they just know what what steps to go through to help mitigate it to the best of our abilities. Any last questions? Yes. Oh, well, two last questions. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, so you've talked about safety and quality and you know anyone can uh, stop the line. So my question to you is how do you ensure that you deliver 
on time and in full. If anybody can stop the line, then how do you deliver? Oh, how, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, well, we, we, have, we have to react fast. So obviously, if, if somebody stops the line, the supervisor's right there. Our supervisors don't leave the area, so they have to stop the line, and then we figure out what the issue is. And many times, it's, it's, not, it's not something that's going to cause us to stop a long time. But, but, but we react very quickly that way, and then we have a, um, there's a, actually most of them are music, but not all plants now because we're not completely standardized. But usually then if it's something that's serious that we need more, they need more people, then there's a code that goes through the, that through the facility where people will come and, and try to fix it very, very quickly. Okay, so that mitigates, to, uh, that mitigates all the risk uh, of, you know, on-time delivery. For instance, you mentioned, uh, you know, you keep low inventory. Um, mm -hmm. So what happens in that case? Well, I mean, if we impact the customer, it costs, it costs a lot of money, up to $75,000 a minute, right? So um, we, ha we protect with them. Um, we have different kinds of safety stacks, right? So finished goods is where, our, where we keep the most. Um, we protect the customer the most with, the, with that. But we are on the phone with them. So if there's something that's going to cause them to impact them, we're talking to them. And our, and our, our initial um, process is to try to get them to build something else so it doesn't impact, the, impact them as, as um, dramatically. But we, we, have, I mean, we have impacted lines for sure, but we try to mitigate that. So um, standardized work is a big thing, and I probably should have mentioned that earlier too. But standardized work is it's the most, um, it's the thing that can, um, it's, repeat, it's repeatable and it makes it robust. So when we do standardized work in our facilities, our plants, every, every associate does the same thing. So you, if you're doing an operation on first shift or second shift, you can't do it your own way. You've got to do it through the standardized work. And we improve the standardized work. Um, if somebody thinks they can do it better, we have a process to, to improve it that way. But that really helps us with keeping things repeatable and robust so we don't have those interruptions with the, in the supply chain. Okay. We had one last question. Uh, hi, my name is Aishwarya, and I'm a Tranet master's student. Uh, so since morning we have been speaking about we analyze the ethical standards of our suppliers, but uh, are we also looking at ethical standards of our customers? So if I have to put it in, in context, for American Axel, if uh, Volkswagen happened to be a customer, and so do we compromise uh, getting a customer versus uh, not knowing if they have the right ethical standards? So, so I, I got everything except for on the on the so ask the question at the end. Uh, so, with the customer, do we compromise? So, do we also look at the customers as ethical standards, with whom we are doing business, or do we also do we no. just look at the suppliers? No, not no, we don't. We um we follow their standards that they give on us, but no, they're sourcing us. So we don't we don't go into their their systems. We we we're very close with our customers, but no. So if I interpret a question, yeah. what she's saying is, you know, Volkswagen had egg on their face. Yep. If you have axles in a Volkswagen product, do you worry that some of that egg transfers to you? Oh yeah, I mean, if you if you look at the Takata, is that the question? Yeah, like the Takata, the the, the, what are the, the um, airbags. Yes. I mean, that's a mess. That 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 company's a mess right now. So definitely, which is why um, quality is number one. It's it's safety is number one, but quality is a very very close number two. And we talk about quality um, in every operating committee that I'm in. The first thing we talk about is safety, and then we go to quality. And um, qu that's why we say that, and we were talking a earlier, for quality issues, we can stop the line because we want to prevent that. So the two school questions kind of tie together. But that would also apply to Starbucks, right? Mm -hmm. So you guys want to recycle all your cups, and if the customer doesn't put it in the right bin. Yep, it's all your fault. You don't recycle. <laughs> You're all customers. Uh, I mean, it, it raises a really good point. Um, obviously, you can't always choose your customer, but you can help give the customer the tools necessary to make the right decision. So in all the Starbucks store, we're rolling out, obviously, recycling programs. So hopefully, it's going to help the customers make the right decision of where do you put that cup? Is it go in this bin or is it go in this bin? Um, and help the impact that way. Obviously, we're, we're eliminating our straws, which is a big undertaking, uh, partially driven by customers, partially driven by just its time. Um, but it is a, it's a joint effort, as I mentioned in my presentation. It's not just <laughs> one side doing it all. We all have to come together to do the right thing. Um, and sometimes it's, it's hard. It's not easy, and sometimes it's more expensive. But ultimately, if it leads to the right positive impact on the planet, that's what we should be doing, collectively. You okay. too. <laughs> with that, I'd like to thank uh, mm -hmm. Faith and Caroline for spending mm -hmm. time with us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. 
So uh, I want to take a few minutes to summarize the conference and uh, get, us, uh, get us ready for the, the case discussions. So first, uh, the, 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 the plan today was to discuss ethical global supply chains. And uh, we've seen a variety of presentations from a range of industries, uh, all the way from manufacturing, coffee making, blockchain, transportation, et cetera. And uh, you know, uh, you know, from from Telamon, all of these companies. And the the main the main story, and I hope the main takeaway we have is first that uh, uh, if you're a student, this is an exciting area of supply chain management to look at. It allows you to use a wide variety of skills. There is there is role for analytics and technology. There's role for working with people. There's role for sort of a global footprint all the way from American Axel's global footprint to Starbucks' global footprint to Telemann's global footprint, et cetera. So there's a lot that you can do with supply chains. There's a lot you can do in the ethical dimension. And there are big, interesting things that will happen with technology, such as blockchain and various, various other tools. And, and if you think through the various uh, examples, uh, there is an opportunity to bridge this divide between developed and developing countries to serve as a beacon, to bring in, uh, bring in mechanisms and, and processes, et cetera. So first, it's an exciting, exciting opportunity, which uh, from, from the perspective of us as faculty, translates into content that will make its way through the classroom. So, that, so that's one. Uh, the second is, this is a challenging role because it does involve choosing. Should I just focus on maximizing the benefit to my shareholders today, or should I do what's best for the brand in the long run? Now, you might think there's no trade-off, but many procurement managers face this trade-off because the CEO has gone and told Wall Street, we're going to bring costs down 5%, which means all the procurement managers are told, OK, give me my 5%. Now, that 5% has to come from somewhere. Now, in the ideal situation, that 5% comes from innovation and taking costs out. That's not always, doesn't always happen. So there is a point at which individuals have to make choices. And I hope uh, some, of the, some of the ideas here are how companies are structuring themselves to enable that individual to, to, to make those choices. So, so that's the second. The third is, given that things are global, it's a more complex challenge because the rules are different, what compliance is different, et cetera. But the one good thing is, uh, complexity is what everybody who is in the supply chain business thrives on. Because if it was simple, you just click a button, everybody else gets fired, and we go home, right? It's complex, and that's what makes it fun and interesting. And I think that's really where uh, it also provides sort of an additional opportunity. So I hope these are things that, uh, that were highlighted at the conference. Again, I, I thank all the speakers who have, who have given us the gift of time. We always sort of rely on the speakers to guide the discussion and to guide the presentations. Now, one of the things that I'll, that I'll hope that you can help us with is uh, if there are ways in which we can improve your access. First, what we'll do is we'll contact each of the speakers, make all of the slides, et cetera, available on our website. We also have video, so we'll make all the videos available. This is for anybody who couldn't attend, want to refer to material. So that's our commitment to you. Of course, all of this requires supply, the, the, the uh, participants' uh, uh, approval, and I hope you'll get that to us quickly. So that's one. Uh, we do want to think of this, uh, what we are trying to do as a center is to increase uh, what I'll call our digital footprint. So the way our digital footprint manifests itself is uh, between all the student GAs and myself, we create blogs, we create small videos, et cetera, all around teams. And I think for the next sort of month or so, we'll have a lot of uh, student GAs work on creating these blogs. And I think that'll, you know, that can be used as a, as a source of information. But uh, the one way that you can help us is if you don't mind taking a minute or two and sending us uh, you know, suggestions for improvement or suggestions for topics that are relevant in your industry and are up and coming, all of that, all of that would, be, would be much appreciated. Uh, I do want to take the time to acknowledge all of the student GAs who are involved. So if you don't mind standing up, that would be great. Maria, you need to stand up. Everybody else, there are the guys there. So uh, all of the, and you see a lot of our GAs at the back. So these are the guys who help us run this conference. There's a lot that happens. The planning here, literally the moment we end, 
within a few weeks, we're thinking about the fall conference and the spring conference and the topics for it, et cetera. One of the reasons is that at Purdue, as I may have told some of you, we try to reserve room 10 years in advance because that's how far you're to, uh, you're to plan in order to get rooms. So uh, we do, first, we want to acknowledge the students. Uh, second, uh, we'd like you to send us ideas on ways we can improve because my belief is that there's always room for improvement. Uh, third, we would love for you to stay immediately. We, we get a short break. OK, uh, we get a short break to have some coffee, but we would love for you to stay here because we have six teams that are going to compete for some real prize money that has been sponsored by General Motors and ArcelorMittal. Yeah, so these are the companies that have sponsored the prize money. So we would love it if you stayed. Uh, there, there was an interesting case. We'll hear more about the case. Are there copies of the case available for people to? Okay, so there are copies of the case available. If you want to browse through the case quickly after you have a cup of coffee, that'll be great. But uh, the case focus on some ethical challenges associated with procurement, and I'll let the teams describe the rest of it, okay? So uh, please, please take the time to have a cup of coffee. Join us, uh, join us back again. If you need to leave because you have a long drive, and I hope most of you don't have to, but if you need to leave, thank you again for coming. Thank you to all of the faculty for attending. And we look forward to you being here uh, in a few minutes after I. Okay. So fall. This, by the way, was spring, as I informed you. This is spring. So fall, September 27th, is our fall conference, and our fall conference is always focused on manufacturing, advanced manufacturing. So we look forward to seeing you there. Uh, however, for now, thank you very much. Thank you to all the speakers. Uh, please do take a short break and uh, have a cup of coffee. In a few minutes, in exactly 10 minutes, the first team will be queued up. Uh, the organization of all of the, the presentations will be done by our students, so we're going to step away and uh, allow you to take a cup of coffee. Thank you again. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think I'm to go back. Yeah, but I'll say you. Is that on yeah. you?